Welcome to Talking With Tech. My name is Chris Bouguet and I'm here with Rachel Madel. What's going on, Rachel? Okay, Chris, I have a story for you and I need your your help here. <laughs> you're, okay, you're, okay. You're, I'm listening. Okay. So, and this is kind of a struggle I think we all can relate to, but essentially I did an assessment for a student, determined the AAC would be really great for the student and like has proven to be really great for the student. Um, so student is six years old, uh, diagnosis of autism, has verbal speech, but was very um, dependent on scripted language, has what I believe to be very severe word retrieval issues. Like this student, like I can hold something up and you can just see the student like trying so hard to find the words and they're always like in the right category, but they just haven't landed on the right word. Um, and I have a lot of students like this. Um, and so I just was like, AAC feels perfect for the student. Like, let's not make it so hard to find the words. Like, Again, like super visual learner um, has been doing beautifully with the device. And what's interesting about this uh, that I don't always see is that the student isn't really eager to use the device. So kind of hesitant to actually hit the buttons, but is super receptive to modeling on the device. So Ma, I've trained mom and communication partners in the home to model language, so to take what this student is saying independently and then modeling one level up, right, including some core words um, and really expanding language. And the student is just doing amazing, is really looking at the device as the communication partner is modeling and then verbalizing um, and it's translating to independent, spontaneous communication that's not super scripted. Um, and, you know, sometimes the student will use the device, um, but but I think that one, I wanted to share that because I feel like sometimes we have this idea that, you know, AAC isn't working if the student isn't building sentences and using the device the way that we would anticipate. And I feel like that's not true. Um, I think that the value of AAC, especially for students who do have the capacity for verbal speech, um, is sometimes just that, that visual input attached with the language. Like that visual input makes a huge difference in the ability to comprehend more abstract language and then again to use it. Um, and so I think that, it, you know, I wanted to share that here because I feel like it's something that, you know, even myself when I first started really getting into AAC, I probably would have been like, well, they're not really using it. It feels like it's not working. And now I see the value in training communication partners to model and provide that aided language input and to see what a student actually does with that. Um, and I've seen a lot of success. So a couple of thoughts here. First of all, um, the, the term AAC, we use it all the time, right? And But so often I think people think of it as AC, alternative communication, and they leave out that aug augmentative part. And what you're talking about here is using it as an augmentative tool. Second, I also see it as maybe it's AIC. Um, uh, alternative instructional communication because you're use the way it sounds like this student is using it is as an instructional tool for themselves to help remember where the words are or learn where the words are and the way I think of that a context to put that in is maybe two stories one is if you ever took a, a test ever in your life where you had to study for the test and then spit that information back out, like if you think back to when you were in grad school, you could remember writing like a mnemonic in your in your notebook. And then when it came time to take the test, you could picture that mnemonic and be like, it was on the right hand side, over in the margin. You could only, you can't, I mean, you can see me, Rachel, but people are watching that I've closed my eyes and I'm thinking, picturing it in my head. Well, that's what this student's doing. They've learned where the words are and they've now, and because it was visual and it was on a, a certain part of the device, they could now kind of picture it in their mind where those words are, right? And the same thing there, that second aspect of that is, I think of that as the difference between recall and recognition. You're using a tool to activate the recognition network to help with a problem with the recall network. And so the way that was explained to me was by Bruce Baker. And the way he explained it to me was, he's like, Chris, tell me all your cousins. I was like, tell me all my cousins. Well, okay, there's, and he's like, look, so your eyes go up to the left and you start thinking about each of your cousins. We may have even done this on the podcast before. And, um, it's like, but now try and think of all the names of your cousins when you show me a picture of your cousins. Well, because you can see the picture of the cousins, I can name them a lot faster. Same thing with AAC. Well, now I, I don't have to hunt and make it so hard for me to retrieve those words. I can recognize those words, and that helps me get there faster.
And then in the future, I won't need them. I might not need it forever. Um, or maybe I will, you know, but uh, maybe there'll be different words that I need pictures of because I've learned where those are and I can picture them in my mind and they become more automatic in the same way that I might leave little sticky notes for myself around my laptop. For right, Like right now, I have little coaching notes to put there because when I'm coaching people through situations, I might refer to those. But once I get better at it, I might not have to refer to those anymore. I don't need that visual anymore. Again, and I, I think this happens uh, with, with kids is sometimes some of the most frequently used words and phrases, they come out so automatically and so easily. And that's because over time, that neural network has become really strong. And so I feel like what happens is when we give that visual input for kids, they then are able to access it easier. And then the more they access it, the easier it becomes and the more automatic it becomes. And so I feel like we're just making the process a lot easier for kids, um, which is so important. And I think that you know, it leads into a bigger discussion, which I'm about to get into the second part of the story, Chris, which isn't as great, <laughs> which is everyone at, in the school team is not adopting the AAC because they said, we don't see the point. He has verbal speech. If only, if only we could invite them to listen to a podcast episode where someone who you who is a part-time AAC user, we could convince them maybe otherwise that that is not an acceptable way to think about AAC. Maybe we could change their mind if we could give them some sort of example. Well, the good news is, Chris, today we have Brittany Dubé on. She is a part-time AAC user, and I'm really excited to have her on to talk about how she uses AAC she does also have verbal speech that she uses, she says, 95% of the time. And I have to share a little bit of a backstory how I know Brittany. Um, I have a YouTube video on my YouTube channel that's called Three AAC Myths Preventing Children with Autism from Making Progress. And basically in that, I talk about these ideas of myths of what introducing AAC uh, will do to a child's communication development. Um, we know that AAC helps kids. Uh, we know that kids who have verbal speech won't become too reliant on AAC. In fact, I see verbal speech often increase when we introduce AAC. Um, and so anyway, the YouTube uh, video goes into all the myths, um, really just trying to dispel um, this notion that AAC um, you know, will, will prevent verbal speech from developing. Um, and Brittany actually responded to that video with a comment. And what's so crazy about this is I screenshot this at one point and I like meant to reach out to her and I was going through my camera roll and I was like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about this comment. And it was so poignant. And I'm going to read the comment that she posted. We talk a little bit about it in the interview, but it's so important to listen to autistic individuals who are adults and help that inform the way we practice. So anyway, she wrote on here, I use AAC at least once a week. I'm an autistic girl, 26 years old and married with two dogs. I'm very independent and 98% of the time, no problem talking and communicating. My reading comprehension and verbal skills are far above average. I love to read. It's one of my favorite things to do. However, I also suffer extreme anxiety and I'm often unable to talk to strangers when first meeting them. I can't get the words out and never know when it's my turn to talk. And sometimes I'm too honest, especially if I'm rushed to respond to a question immediately without really taking the time to process what was said to me. Using AAC helps give me more time to process as it allows me to take the time to formulate my response by swiping and finding each word, which takes longer than just talking. Also, people are more understanding and willing to wait for a response when they see me use a device to communicate. AAC isn't just for kids. Honestly, sure it's great if AAC is a stepping stone to talking, but if your child prefers AAC to talking and doesn't wish to talk, there's nothing wrong with someone using AAC to communicate their entire lives. Nothing wrong with that at all. I love my phone and tablet and AAC apps so much. There is nothing wrong with it. You're right. Super powerful. I think it's oftentimes the adults who are just so fixated on this idea of, um, you know, how communication should look and what that what we should do as educators to make it look like this projected vision of what we think communication looks like. And I just would encourage everyone, uh, especially parents, to just really try to broaden this concept of what communication looks like, because the reality is 
all day long, we're communicating in alternative augmentative ways. <laughs> we are all using AAC in a variety of ways throughout our day. And so, you know, if your child needs some type of alternative um, or augmentative system to communicate more easily in a way they feel safer and more comfortable, ultimately, isn't that our goal to just empower individuals to be able to communicate in whatever way they decide is easiest and best for them? That is the goal. That is it. That's it. I don't even want to say anything because that was the powerful message right there. So without further ado, let's listen to your interview with Brittany Dubay. Are you enjoying this episode? We would love for you to take a few minutes to hit the subscribe button so you always know when we release new content. Even better, if you leave us a review on iTunes, then more people will find this podcast and learn about AAC. We also love reading your reviews on air. Thank you so much for your support. We love this community. Now we can head back into the episode. Welcome to Talking With Tech. I'm your host, Rachel Madel, and I'm super excited to be joined by Brittany Dubay. Brittany is a 28-year-old autistic girl who loves making YouTube videos, educating people about her experience being autistic, and showcasing great books written by autistic authors that promote and educate on the topic of neurodiversity. She's been featured on the What is Autism channel in the series Unmasked Conversations, and is in the process of writing her first novel. In her spare time, she also trains service dogs with her husband and is taking a course to learn American Sign Language Brittany, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited that you came on to talk to us today. Well, thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. So can you just start off by just introducing yourself, telling people a little bit about yourself? Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, I think you pretty much said it all in the introduction there. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I am, uh, I am autistic. Um, I in my spare time, uh, I am currently training a for myself, and my husband is training uh, his own uh, his own service dog. And uh, yeah, I uh, I do have a, a YouTube channel where I just sort of talk about just sort of my experiences uh, as a as an autistic girl. So that's fun. Um, I'm a big big neurodiversity uh, proponent, so there's that. Um, yeah. <laughs> let me let me put give the listeners a little bit of backstory. So Brittany, you had commented on one of my YouTube videos and for some reason, I don't know why, I just didn't I didn't see it and I was going through old emails and I saw it and I was like, oh my goodness. And you were talking about this idea of part-time AAC user. Um, so I, it was a, I of course do a lot of videos on AAC. I'm a speech language pathologist who specializes in that, you know, area. And when you started talking on that comment about how you use AAC part-time, um, I was super excited. I of course asked you to come on the podcast because I think we need more people like you to talk about their experience and how sometimes verbal speech is hard and sometimes we need a backup or an alternative. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about yeah. what it's like to be a part-time AAC user um, and your yeah. experience with that? Yeah, of course. So um, for me, uh, first of all, you know, I was I was super, super surprised uh, when you asked me to uh, to come on here. Um, I was super honored to uh, to do that. Um, I am generally quite, uh, quite verbal. I'm, I'm quite eloquent. I can usually uh, express myself with, you know, little little to no problem. Um, I, I also I read a lot. You know, I have a very kind of, you know, large vocabulary, but even even still. Um, I find like when I'm when I tend to get uh, overwhelmed or if I'm meeting new people or if I'm in a situation where I'm having to sort of, you know, if, if I'm having a lot of questions fired at me at once or I'm, I'm trying to sort of process multiple things, at least for me, uh, I find AAC can be, uh, you know, really valuable sort of tool for, you know, just just helping me to communicate uh, when I, I find sometimes, you know, communicating verbally, there's this kind of expectation that people have that you're going to respond right away. You know, as soon as they ask you a question, it's like, okay, you know, and they're standing there and they're looking at you and they're expecting 
an answer and they're expecting you to answer in a certain way. And they're expecting, you know, people have all these expectations along with, with verbal speech. So sometimes I find for myself um, taking that extra minute to sort of process what, what was said to me and, you know, how I want to respond. I find if I take out, you know, my iPad and I bring up an app and start to use that to, uh, maybe reply to the question or what have you. Um, I find the expectations kind of go like usually the people tend to be more, more patient when they see you communicating via a device than they are when you're, you're talking verbally to them. So, um, at least, at least that's been my experience. The other side to that though, is I do find sometimes when you're using a device to communicate, people don't always give what you're saying the same sort of weight or the same sort of respect that they would if you were speaking verbally, um, which is is unfortunate. But uh, but yeah, that's that's been my my experience, and that's kind of how how I use it. I use it during meltdowns and that as well. But uh, more more often, thankfully, my meltdowns are not not that frequent. But more often than not, it's usually just when I'm out and about meeting new people or if I'm, you know, having to, you know, in the grocery store or whatever, if there's a lot of sort of sensory input going on, it's easier for me to take that extra time to process. So, yeah. And I think that that's, um, it's really awesome insight thinking about, you know, communication doesn't always come easily or consistently, which is part of what, you know, I'm always trying to educate parents on, Um, you know, yes, like, you know, you have a child who's able to use verbal speech. Um, We have this expectation. You talked a lot about expectations, which I really appreciated. Uh, We have this expectation that that communication comes easily and consistently. And I think that that's, you know, that's wrong. Um, and what I'm hearing from you is you, you saying like, yes, that is incorrect. Like sometimes, you know, maybe verbal speech comes easier when you have, you know, you're surrounded by people that you, you know, know and feel comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And it probably depends like what day and time and how much sleep you got and like all these factors that go into it. Um, and so having that backup system can be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what what I would sort of you know put forth is that I know for myself it depends too on on the topic. So for me personally, I'm I'm very good at sort of describing things kind of like external things. But when it comes to internal things, like for example, you know, if I'm talking to my doctor and they're asking me, well, what what are you feeling? You know, what what exactly does it feel like? Well, that for me is very difficult to sort of describe, you know, verbally, especially, you know, at an appointment, you know, you're under kind of a time constraint. So it it makes it even harder. But I, I definitely think that the biggest point to drive home for me would be that all forms of communication, you know, whether it be sign language or, or, um, you know, using an app or verbal speech or, you know, speaking, you know, a different language than what, you know, your peers do, you know, whatever it might be, all those forms of communication, I think are equally valid and should be given, you know, an equal amount of respect just because someone, whether they're doing it by choice or not, just because somebody is using an alternative way to communicate with you, doesn't mean that their thoughts and feelings are less valid or that they're less intelligent or that, you know, all of a sudden have this, you know, right to speak for that person. Um, It it should all be given sort of an equal weight. And I, I, I don't see that happening and it needs to happen more for sure. Well, hopefully with interviews like this, Brittany, like we'll be spreading the message and really trying to break down some of those misconceptions. Um, I think it's a very Mm -hmm. common thing that when people use some type of alternative communication system um, that 
you know, they're not as intelligent or like you said, it's not given uh, the respect and the weight that it deserves. Um, and so I think that just like educating people about, you know, this idea of part-time AAC can be really helpful. Um, and of course, listening to your experience and how you use an alternative system sometimes dependent on the situation um, is really helpful. Um, curious, cause I'm, you know, we geek out on AAC on this podcast, curious what systems that you use or you found really helpful. So, um, for myself, um, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to learn sign language. I've, I've started learning, so that's been very helpful, uh, for me, but I have, um, I use the app, uh, uh, I use two, two apps on my, on my tablet and on my phone. Um, one is, um, one is called uh, QuickType, and it is a it's a text based app. So you just type in the word, and then you hit a button, and then it says the word. Um, mm-hmm. And then the other one that I use is can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it, but it, it's a symbol based, like it has pictures, and you you go on and and you you hit the picture. Uh, it's called uh, Acorn. That's what it's called, Acorn. Mm-hmm. Yep, I heard um, that one. And it's it's yeah, it's it's really neat. I like it because when I'm trying to talk to people um, or I'm trying to communicate with somebody, you know, I don't always necessarily want to be scrolling through pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of symbols looking mm-hmm. for the word that I'm trying to get out. Um, so the nice thing about the acorn is that it has that tree and you know, you press on a word and it says the word, but then it gives you suggestions of logically what the next word would be. So it makes it really easy to find. And I like how it learns to how you talk. So yeah, I like those things. Yeah. I mean, those are really awesome features that like word prediction, right? That predictive nature. Um, it's really cool mm-hmm. what, what, what machines are able to do now, as far as like learning your patterns and the, you know, probably the words that you're putting together frequently. Um, so yeah, those are really awesome features. And, um, I think, Another thing I want to kind of drive home here is that a lot of people actually have more than one system. So it sounds like you are like, yes, sometimes I have like a type, you know, text-based system. Other times I find, you know, using a symbol-based system. Um, So I think that's just really important because, you know, we've had a lot of AAC users on this podcast and that's a very common thread is I don't just use one system. Like there's different features I need for different times. Um, And so it's cool to hear that you also have two different systems that you use. Well, three if you include the American Sign Language. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. And I'm really curious too. So how how did you figure out that a tool like this would be helpful to you? Like, did you have someone who like recommended it or you're just kind of trying to like on your own figure out like how can I, you know, be supported in these situations where maybe verbal speech isn't coming, you know, as easily? Well, actually, um, it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting little story. So um, when I initially sort of got, my diagnosis. Um, I had no idea that these things even existed. I didn't even know this was a thing. Like I, I had no idea. I knew that, you know, when usually when I would, you know, when I would feel overwhelmed, I just wouldn't talk. It would be that simple. And actually, you know, a lot of my classmates, you know, I, I remember at the end of the, at the end of my grade 11 year, I was walking out of class and I said something to one of my classmates. I think I said, you know, have a good summer or something like that. And my classmates stopped and looked at me and like their jaw just like hit the floor. It was like, oh my God, she can talk. Like they, they just, they could not believe that because they, they had never heard me. Like they had very rarely heard me speak, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I remember though, years later, that was years prior, but years later, after I got my diagnosis, you know, I started to kind of do some more research into this and kind of what being autistic was like, what, what was this? What did this mean Mm -hmm. um, for me? And, you know, through that, um, I discovered uh, YouTube and I discovered some other um, autistic YouTubers um, and and parents, especially of um, autistic children who would, you know, use these devices to help their child communicate. 
And I started kind of looking at that and I thought to myself, you know what, that looks like it would be really helpful, you know, for me, because what I was doing originally, which is, it's a form of AAC. What I was doing originally was when I couldn't talk, I would just, I would have to run to, you know, another room and and grab a pen and a piece of paper and like write down what I was trying to say to the person. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I, through sort of discovering the YouTube and, and kind of starting to just sort of get more involved in the community, I, I noticed that, you know, for, you know, many autistic children, it was something that was very common you know, to, to kind of, you know, say, well, you know, we need to find an alternative way for them to communicate. So I just got one on my, myself and I just sort of tried it out and yeah, it just kind of evolved from there. Um, it proved to be really helpful for me. Uh, and then I started noticing though, that there was, um, you know, there, there was a little bit of judgment at first, you know, like, why, why do you need this? Like, you're perfectly able to speak, like, but um, after I kind of started to explain to people um, that I was using it in order to take that extra time to process, um, I noticed people were, were a lot more accepting of it. Um, and it, it really just sort of floored me because I found it so helpful And I thought to myself, you know, you you don't see a lot of, you know, there's, there's so much focus on autistic children. And like, while I understand that there's, you know, it's like, what happens when these children grow up? Like, what, what do you think they're just going to like magically be not autistic anymore? It doesn't work like that. So, you know, so, you know, seeing this and kind of looking into it and then finally discovering that, you know, this was something that it it took me a long time to find another autistic young adult who used this, who, you know, that this, this was a thing that was, you know, was happening, even though it wasn't kind of in the main eye of what was going on. It was kind of, you know, over here, but it was still happening. I don't know if that makes sense, but Yeah. So that's kind of how I discovered it. Just sort of discovering YouTube and and getting an app on on my phone and trying it out. And right. And and I think what's really interesting about that is that's kind of what we do with all the tools and technology we have, right? Like we say, oh, here's an app. Like maybe, maybe I'll use this app. Like, let me see how this app works. Um, You know, I think with your situation, it sounds like there was this added layer of um, misunderstanding and potentially judgment associated um, because people look at you and think, well, she talks like, why would you need this? The same way people look at kids that I work with who talk verbally and say, well, why would they need this? Um, You know, it's, it's really just important, I think, to think about when we're, if we're specifically thinking about kids, right? Because you are an adult and you can decide what you do and you can decide what tool you have, uh, which is, which is wonderful. But for kids, it's like, it's really like parents and educators and there's kind of all these gatekeepers um, deciding whether or not a child could have access to a system or a tool that could be really useful. Um, And so what we advocate on this podcast is, you know, it doesn't hurt. AAC doesn't hurt to give a student um, as an alternative means to communicating when they're struggling or also to just teach language, to teach literacy, to teach reading and writing and all these things that we know AAC can be really useful for. Um, But for kids, it's like, there's all these adults that's potentially like roadblocking access to that. Um, And so I just think hearing your experience is so valuable. And I just, um, I'm super excited to to share this episode because um, I, I, I always knew this working with kids, I always knew that sometimes verbal speech didn't come easily or consistently, which is why kids go to their devices, right? Like, and it's not a bad (laughs) thing. I think sometimes parents are like, I don't want them to use a device. I want them to talk. And my response to that is I want them to do what's ever easiest for them. So if using a device is easier and they're more willing to communicate with us using a device, then that's what I want. Um, And so anyway, I would love to know your thoughts and actually any, you know, advice or 
things that you would say to parents who are, you know, potentially have autistic children um, who do have verbal speech, but, um, you know, perhaps AAC could be a valuable tool. Like, what would you say to, you know, families and parents? So um, I I think for myself, um, so I would first start out by saying that um, it's important to remember that lack of speech, in this case, verbal speech, um, does not indicate lack of understanding or lack of intelligence or lack of um, ability to, um, lack of ability to, to understand and to, um, you know, know what you're saying. Um, I, 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 I've seen a lot of, you know, even before I was diagnosed, um, I spent a lot of time with diagnosed autistic children in where I went to school. Um, And I noticed there was a lot of this kind of idea of, um, it was almost like, uh, like babying, you know? It was almost like this kind of idea that, you know, oh, well, they can't talk, so they must not understand what what I'm saying to them. And I, I would I would encourage uh, parents and families to to talk, you know, to when you're when you're talking to your child or, or your loved one, um, you know, understand that, you know, it's very it's very possible that they are understanding everything that you're saying. Um, you know, and if your child was was decided that they were going to speak French as opposed to speak English, you know, would you would you say, well, no, I I, I don't like that. I don't want you to speak French. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, it's just it's yeah. it's it, it's like it's like a different language. It's mm-hmm. almost, you know, your, your child is almost, you know, telling you or or the person's telling you, you know, this language is easier for me to speak and to communicate with you than, you know, than this other one. And, you know, I I would encourage parents and families to not see it as a problem, but rather to take a different approach and see it as, as an opportunity to, you know, connect with this person and to get to know them and to, you know, just sort of, have have a relationship with them. Um, I I would encourage them to to you know take an an open minded view to understand that just because you know there's a certain expectation depending upon where you live that you're going to speak a certain way um, doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's going to work for everyone. Um, you know you know, what you, you know, a lot of parents understand that, you know, one size fits all doesn't work in terms of healthcare or education or, you know, all these other things, but yet they want it to in terms of speech and communication. That's just not it at at all. Like it, it, one size fits all just doesn't, it doesn't work because everyone's an individual, right? And I think too, it's important to recognize that, you know, your, your child is not going to stay a child. They're going to grow up and they're going to become a, a, an autistic adult. And, you know, when you're talking to them and when you're talking around them, you know, it's very possible that, that they hear and, and, and understand what, what you're saying. And I, I would say that, you know, um, you know, I, I, I am a parent. My child passed away, unfortunately, but I, I am a parent. Um, and I would say that, you know, if, if it were my child or even for myself, you know, I would rather see my loved one confident in communicating in the way that works best for them, especially as an, as an adult, when they're going to have to communicate with the world around them, um, as opposed to, you know, feeling like, you know, there's something wrong with them or there's, you know, that it's a big problem that they have to communicate in this way. I, I would encourage 
parents and families to uh, to to n- not make it into a problem, but rather just to uh, you know look at it as an opportunity and um, you know just just encourage any any form of of communication, whatever that might be. So. I love that so much, Brittany. And I feel like that's definitely a sound bite that I feel like we're going to share like on social media because it was super powerful. And you talked about AAC as another language and you use that metaphor, which is what we use a lot. Um, but there's no judgment associated with learning French or Spanish or all these other language, languages, right? Um, and so just like really thinking, you know, kind of taking away mm-hmm. all everything else and realizing that, you know, we want some we want a a language system to be able to connect with the world around us, to be able to, you know, form relationships and maintain relationships and grow relationships. And so, you know, I love that. And I love that advice to parents because I think that ultimately, like, I think every parent wants to connect with their child um, and they don't realize the power of giving, you know, a tool or a technology like AAC to do that. Um, and so I think it's just listening to people like you talk about their experience. Um, and of course, all the other AAC users we've had on the podcast. Um, super excited that you shared that. And um, I think that's really awesome advice. I'm curious if you have any other stories. I love, people love stories. They love funny ones, heartwarming ones. Do you have any stories that you think are, you know, great to share with our audience? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, hmm, I, I think, uh, the, the, the most incredible story that I can think of, um, my, uh, my stepfather, um, he is a, he worked as a paramedic for over 30 years. Um, he's recently retired. Um, but when he was still working as, as a paramedic, um, there's, there's a, uh, a young girl who lives in, in our, our local area, um, who she is, uh, she is autistic. Um, it's very clear that she is autistic. Um, she doesn't have a formal diagnosis yet, um, but she's in the process of, of getting that. Um, but it, it's very, very clear to her and to everyone around her um, that she, she is in fact autistic. Um, but um one day, uh, my my stepdad was at work, and he ended up getting a call to this girl's house. Um, and here she was, she was laying in the mud and screaming and hitting herself and just having a complete meltdown. Um, and you know, her her mom and I guess the mother's boyfriend didn't know what to do or how to help her. And so they, what did they do? They, they called 911 and they called, they called the paramedics. And, and so when they showed up, um, they, you know, the, the, my stepdad's partner went over to speak to the parents to kind of figure out what was going on. And the parents had said, well, you know, we, we can't get her under control. We don't know what to do. Like, you know, like, you know, can you like sedate her or something like, you know, and obviously, you know, sedating her and taking her to the hospital would have been incredibly traumatic for her. Um, so what ended up happening was, uh, my stepdad went over and he got down on her level and he looked at her and he said, he said, Hey, he said, you know, and he introduced himself and he said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a paramedic. I'm here to help. He said, you know, he said, you know, can you, can you like, he says, let's make a deal, he says. And she stopped and looked at him, you know, she's all covered in mud and, and just like tears on her face. And she's just like, and she, what, what does she do? She stops and she looks at him and she says, well, what's a deal? And well, a deal is where I, you give something to me and I give something to you. 
he said, you know, I, I understand that, you know, you're, you're having a hard time because you don't, what, what had triggered the meltdown was that she, her, her mom wasn't sure if she was going to send her to summer camp on that Friday. And I guess she had had it in her head that she was going to summer camp and, and they had planned it all and everything. And all of a sudden the mom said, well, I'm not sure if you're going. And obviously that for an autistic person is like, what? Like, no, this, you know, especially someone who hasn't had any supports or, or anything, you know, to be able to cope with, with change in, in any way. Um, so anyway, so she says, so what's the deal? And he says, well, you give something to me and I'll give something to you. He says, so you stand up and dust yourself off. He said, and you just, you know, try, you know, just stand up, dust yourself off and take, take a few deep breaths. And in return, he says, I will have your your stepdad go in and run you a bath and you're going to go in and take a bath. And then I'm going to talk to your mom and you are going to camp on Friday. And she kind of looked at him and was like, huh? Okay. And she stood up, dusted herself off. And he, he called the, the mother's boyfriend or whatever over and he said to him, he said, you know, he said, he said, can you go in and run her a bath? And the boyfriend kind of looked at him like, what, what did you just say to me? Like, what, you want me to go in and run her a bath? And my stepdad looked at him and he said, do I have to ask you twice? He says, go in and run her a bath. Like, <laughs> it's not complicated. Like, yeah. geez. And she was fine. And it avoided her having to be sedated and restrained and taken to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, someone, you know, understanding her and treating her with, with, with the respect that she deserved. You know, um, I, I, I noticed that a lot of times, you know, whether an autistic person is verbal or nonverbal or semi-verbal, you know, many autistic people are highly, highly intelligent you know, and, and, you know, it's just people having this lack of understanding and, and not, not giving them the respect they deserve. And, you know, so for her, that, that was really, I thought that was just an incredible story. And my stepdad said to me that, you know, because of his experiences with me, he knew how to, how to approach her and how to, you know, help her. And it, 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 it was a beautiful thing. You know, she got up and went in and, took her bath and she went to camp on Friday and everyone was happy. So, yeah. I love that story. And I think that it, I think it kind of showcases a lot of different things. And I think one of them is, um, you know, really, really trying to understand why someone is upset um, having a meltdown. Um, I think it helps to have background understanding about, um, you know, autistic adults who, and children who have a hard time with change and, um, a change of routine can oftentimes be very triggering. And so, um, it sounds like this, this, um, this woman didn't have a diagnosis yet. So they didn't have the kind of understanding education support to really understand that. Um, and it sounds like your dad was able to really help, um, in that kind of situation, which is awesome. And I also think that, you know, it, sometimes it just takes like, taking a deep breath and really trying to have a conversation. Um, I think that when someone's really upset, like we kind of get in this fight or flight mode too, where we're like, I don't really know what to do. I guess I'll call 911. You know, we make all these kind of like really rash decisions sometimes. And, um, you know, just like really mm -hmm. trying to like, like you said, get down on her level, um, like try to, you know, remain calm and just like figure out what's going on. Um, so that's really helpful. I'm curious, Brittany, like, what helps you calm down? Like if you're in a situation where you feel either dysregulated sensory wise, or, you know, you have a, a, a moment, um, where you're feeling, you know, perhaps out of control, <clears throat> like what are things that you've learned over time that can kind of help in that situation? Um, so, um, 
it, it's kind of funny uh getting back to the, the ac like that's that's a big one um just you know having the ability to communicate you know this is what i need right now um you can't verbally say that to you um that really helps uh quite a bit um the, i it, i actually um i had a meltdown a few days ago um and it was it was really because of this cold um i was having a, a coughing fit and um i just i it just became too much for me um but i i find like external things i've i've learned how to how to cope with um internal things like being sick are still you know very much a struggle because you know when something's happening externally you know i can i can block it out like i have noise canceling headphones i can put those on um you know my husband will often he will often come over and he'll put his hand on my elbow and he'll say to me you know are are you okay or or do you need to leave you know he'll check in with me um and oftentimes you know just just having having a, a device having a distraction you know whether it be music or or what have you um is very helpful um but the biggest thing that for me that helps is just leaving the situation getting away from whatever it is that's upsetting me mm-hmm. and obviously you know when you have a cold that's a lot more difficult to do because you know it 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 is it's inside you you can't exactly go to another room and be like okay yeah no i'm just like not dealing with this right now it doesn't quite work like that so unfortunately so yeah so but uh no definitely though uh external things biggest thing that helps me calm down is just just leaving leaving the situation and also um music is a big thing for me um i i love listening to music so i often will you know i'll have my my phone and my headphones and i will put those on um and i will you know i'll just put on music and just try to kind of block everything out um mm. yeah yeah, I love those strategies. And I'm sure like, as you, you know, as time goes on, you continue kind of to learn those coping strategies, what works for you. And I think we all do, you know, as adults. Okay. So Brittany, everybody that we have on this podcast, I always ask the question, if you had a billboard that everyone could see, what would your billboard say? Hmm. You know, to be completely honest, I haven't the faintest idea. I've thought about that question, but to be completely honest, I haven't the faintest idea. No and, worries. And I, I, I think, I, I think the the part of the reason for that is that um, you know there are so many messages that I, you know, I would want to put on that billboard. My billboard would be like, you know, it would be like a novel. Like there, there would be no, I, I wouldn't be able to shorten it up enough to, uh, to, to fit on there. So, well, no worries. I, I think this episode is evidence of all of the gems of wisdom that you have to share. And, um, yeah, I mean, why a billboard when we can do a whole book? And it sounds like you're, you're in the process of writing a book. So, can you tell us a little bit about your book, your YouTube channel, where people can find you if they want to learn more about you? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so my YouTube channel is, uh, is called uh, Little Autobots uh, Fantasy Books. Um, you can find me on Instagram. It's at little Aspie bat. Um, and, and the bat thing is because Halloween is a special interest of mine. Um, I love all kinds of spooky things and anything to do with Halloween. So, um, it's actually kind of, I find it very comforting in a weird way, but yeah, no, it's definitely, uh, so so uh yeah my youtube channel um i pretty much i do all kinds of you know book reviews and like um you know just uh booktube kind of content um but i also make content um i make kind of regular training updates with the service dogs and so if you guys are interested to see that um and i also talk a lot about i do autism related videos about you know things that that i'm experiencing and and um just sort of life stuff and and how how you know 
kind of just from my perspective as as an autistic person. So um, yeah, so that's basically the best places to find me are YouTube and Instagram. Um, as far as the book goes, it's a uh, it's a fantasy novel. It's still very much uh, very much in in the works, but I'll be releasing um, kind of more updates about that as 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 it goes. So you know, find me on social media if you want to know more about the book and. Well, I'm really excited, Brittany. We're going to share your YouTube channel and your Instagram and all the things in our show notes so people can follow your work and see what you're up to. I think it's really helpful for autistic adults to help us understand how to work better with, you know, the students that we serve. Um, there's no better way to really think about the way that we're, you know, communicating with and working with, uh, you know, kids who have autism than to listen to adults. Um, I think that it's been so cool to see this wave over the last 10 years of autistic adults talking about their experience, writing books about their experience, YouTube channels, sharing on social media. And so I just am really excited because, um, there's no better way to learn than to listen to the adults, uh, you know, that we, we have mm -hmm. and to listen to their experience. Um, so thank you so much for coming on today. I'm really, really excited to share this episode. Um, I think you shared so many gems of wisdom and um, really excited to, to showcase your experience. Um, one sort of just parting thought is uh, in terms of AAC, you know, a lot of people, when they think of AAC, they think of, you know, high tech, like iPads and that kind of thing. And that is, is certainly one form of it. Um, but I, I would also, you know, encourage parents, you know, if your child is more comfortable using a, a, a book with, you know, Velcro symbols, or if your child is more comfortable using, a, you know, maybe they can't talk, but maybe they can write, maybe they, you know, they, they, you know, just because you can't speak, doesn't mean lack of literacy either. You know, if your child can write or if they can type or however it is that they they communicate, you know, even if it's just with a pen and paper, um, it's certainly better than, than not communicating at all. And it's definitely, uh, you know, just as valid as, as, as verbal speech. So I would encourage you not to have a, a, a narrow view of, of what AAC is. I love so, that. I think that's, that's really that's really great parting advice. Let's be open to all forms of AAC and really listen to, you know, the people who need to use the AAC. That's who should be guiding what is used. And, you know, as the adults around uh, a child um, or an adult supporting them, it's like we just need to be open to whatever systems work best, mm -hmm. it sounds like. Exactly. Yeah. Am amazing. Brittany, so. thank you so much for coming on today. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Amazing. So for Talking With Tech, I'm Rachel Needle, joined by Brittany Dubay. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll talk to you guys next week.